नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस for example while he was going through this big scandal in cambridge where he was seeing this woman who was already married to somebody else and in the process of getting a divorce he would push his chair back from the cambridge dining table and say well right i'm off to sleep with my mistress tonight and then he would go off and you know this would shock and scandalize everyone and he he never held back from any of this stuff when jbs haldane died in 1964 in bhubaneswar he was an indian scientist he had the passport but he also had a deep and abiding love for the country his move to india was a final act in the boisterous life of haldane a geneticist a staunch communist and an all-round rabble rouser the story of a man who wrote his first scientific paper in the trenches of the first world war who was a card carrying member of the communist party who went to spain to fight the fascists during the civil war who was under heavy suspicion of being a spy for the Soviets who courted trouble and ticked off the establishment repeatedly in this episode of BIC talks historian of science Janvi Phalke and Shaman Subramanian author of a dominant character the radical science and restless politics of JBS Haldane discuss Haldane's contributions to genetics which are singular and in tandem with his communist beliefs they make us think about how science and politics intersect and how genetics continues to throw up great ethical and political conundrums today as it did in Haldane's time and now over to Janvi it's fabulous to have this opportunity to speak with you about the book about a very interesting and colorful character um, so i'm going to start with the most obvious question which is to ask you how were you drawn to Haldane why Haldane Tell us more. Okay, so I came to Holden sort of backwards. I essentially encountered the latter part of his life before anything else, and the latter part of his life was essentially the life of a British scientist living in Calcutta and then Bhubaneswar, becoming an Indian citizen, working here, dying here, and that intrigued me a little bit because you know usually in the larger scheme of things we're used to. scientists moving in the opposite direction and here was somebody who had come here given up all his habits and his his attachments back home and made an indian of himself and that was very intriguing and so you i wanted to learn more and my contention is that nobody can even read the uh, the barest wikipedia summary of holden's life without being absolutely blown away by the amount of drama and spectacle he has managed to pack into these 70 years quite apart from his greatness as a scientist and i'm sure we'll come to that but this is a man who wrote his first scientific paper when he was in the trenches in the first world war who was in spain during the civil war who did military research for uh, the government in the second world war to the point of injuring himself who um, you know was a lifelong communist sometimes to the detriment of his own ideals and this is not even to mention his childhood which is essentially filled with drama because his his own father followed this practice of experimenting on on himself and on his son on young jbs and so even to read all of this you is is to be astonished at the kind of life he led and then you learn a little bit more about the science and you are blown away by what he did the breadth of his intellectual curiosity his engagement with not only the sciences but the humanities mm-hmm. with literature with the science of politics and he's a very irascible fellow you know as as we see in india he's a real character you really want to get to know this character in a lot more depth so part of the reason i wrote this book is because i want to know more about him and this was my way of satisfying my curiosity and then uh, i did a cup a little bit of reading and i realized that there was only one other biography of his that was written it was written very soon after he died and was not good to put it bluntly i mean it was skimpy on the science and didn't kind of engage with the politics enough and so i thought there was really an opportunity here to do justice to such a you know larger than life figure wanting to know more about someone is as good a reason to write a biography as any other i would think so given that i'm a historian myself i'm i'm going to proceed chronologically could you give us a sense of holden up until his work of course as you said he's already done some research during the during the first world war and and the interwar period i do want to ask you a little bit more about science and politics 
you know, during the Second World War, especially in Britain, because there's a lot that there's a lot of ferment at that point of time. But since we are withholding, could you give us a sense of what he did and the science he engaged in up until the Second World War? And we'll come to the politics immediately after that. Yeah, okay. So Haldane was an odd figure. You know, he was extremely adept at mathematics even as a child. Because of his father, he was trained in sort of physiology to a large extent as well. It's extremely sort of good at the things that he was interested in and not really good at anything that bored him. And, and so he kind of occupied this, you know, this weird niche where he became a scientist without ever having acquired a degree in the sciences. Yeah. He had a degree in, in classics yeah. and mathematics. But he had no other, he had no formal training beyond that as a scientist at all. And so all of this was essentially acquired, as you might say, on the job. And it was made easier because he was not an experimental scientist. He was very firmly somebody who would sort of take pen and paper and sit in a corner and work out equations. And so his entire approach to the burgeoning science of genetics was to bring a kind of arithmetic approach or a statistical approach to the science. And what did the science need at that point, fortunately, was a kind of statistical technique. And at that point, so early in the 20th century, scientists had just rediscovered Mendel's laws of genetics. They had been discovered about 40 years ago by Mendel, but then had lain dormant for a long time. And, and they were trying to figure out how that could fit with the Darwinian model of evolution, of natural selection. And at that time, they see, they, these two seemed to be incompatible. We won't get into the details of it, but basically the difference lies in how Mendel thought that each gene, if you were, you know, each gene that varied resulted in one big change in your in your physiology or appearance. And Darwin, Darwin always postulated small incremental changes that added up. And so these two seemed to be quite incompatible and nobody knew what to do with them. And here was Haldane, who essentially found a mathematical way to show that small incremental changes of the kind that Darwin described could actually lead to big changes in physiology or appearance in, the, in an organism in a relatively short time. It didn't need sort of millennia for it to happen. And this kind of, you know, the science that he eventually proposed came to be known as a modern synthesis. And beginning in about in the 1920s, for 10 years, he wrote a series of 10 papers. And in the book, I describe how, you know, in writing these papers, he's very much like a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. He sets down a basic line of arithmetic logic. And he says, well, this is what happens in this kind of scenario. And then like a jazz musician, he riffs, he varies this, you know, what happens if a population migrates? Let's see what happens in that scenario. What happens if there's a big sort of external event, like a disease? Yeah. Since we're all aware of this now, what happens to a population and natural selection then? So he's kind of riffing off this in each of these 10 papers. And the result is a body of work that has essentially defined natural selection unto the present day. And so that is really, you know, I mean, I've left out other things he did. You know, he proposed an extremely viable theory that still holds water of how life began on Earth. Just a, you know, casual eight-page paper tossed off in a, you know, not even a a peer-reviewed journal, just a popular journal. And that's, you know, the Haldane Operan hypothesis, as it's called, is still the def one of the defining models of how life began on Earth. He tested himself for biochemistry, you know, he tested his blood chemistry by drinking diluted hydrochloric acid. I mean, we won't even go into all of this. But the main contribution was the series of 10 papers in genetics over 10 years. So this is the time when people working in both statistics as well as genetics have a very tenuous, sometimes what in hindsight is, can be called controversial relationship with eugenics. Could you tell us a little more about Haldane's relationship to his peers and to the idea of eugenics? Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because it, uh, you know, Haldane's views evolve over time, which is quite salutary. So, you know, as he grew up in quite a prosperous family, and so at, in, his, in his youth, as a young man, he was sort of, he reflected some of the biases hmm. of particular class of society. So in his earliest writings, you can definitely find sort of hints to his thinking about what, um, you know, about the differences in races, for example, or what pe what was perceived as racial differences back in the day. So there's, for example, an extremely derogatory reference to Australian Aborigines. And he kind of wonders if, even with all the culture in the world, whether they will ever rise to the level of Western European society and achievement. But the key thing to note here, and the thing that really is sort of so interesting and rewarding about writing a biography, is that you can see, you can track the way his views change. And so he finds out more about, you know, genetics itself expands to, to reveal that these racial differences are not actually that deep. 
And so he kind of draws from that. He is very critical about the ways in which the rich and powerful in British society in particular regard the poor. And he, he kind of says, you know, there's no such thing as a gene for being poor. There's no, there's no sort of genetic inferiority in the poorer classes in, in England. They're essentially, in a sense, sort of poor because they're being kept that way. All of this hardens his own socialist yes. principles. And by the time we get to the 1940s, he is as staunch a defender of racial equality as you will see, which is very important because at that time, you not only have Nazi Germany and its own theories of blood, and he writes essays demolishing this theory completely, but even in the US and the UK, things that are not well known now, quite hidden now, in the US, there was a huge program to sterilize you know, inferior people, inevitably black people. In the UK, there was a big drive to segregate mm -hmm. inferior people, which in that particular context meant the poor, the poor, or the mentally disturbed. And there was, you know, Haldane has never let an opportunity go by to criticize all of these policies mm -hmm. in the US and the UK and in Germany. So I think that's, you know, it's, it's really a fine example of how we ought to let science guide our thinking and our opinion. And of course, Haldane was in the thick of all of this throughout the 30s and 40s. I'm tempted now to ask you about his studies of oral hair that he conducted in, when he moved to India and, and how endogamous relationships or marriages in India might be correlated to men, particularly in Andhra, growing oral hair. But we'll come back to that and humor in Haldane's life in a, in a, in a second. Speaking about the period in the lead up to the Second World War, you have, you have figures like uh, John Desmond Bernal, and many others in India and in the UK with very strong left of center politics and politics that they brought to the discussion of science on the table. So not only a flurry of publications on very, if you see the first editions of these, of these books and papers that are written, they're often on, on uh, Russian paper, right? Like during the, during the war sort of, and, and you see the quality of the paper. And it's, it's actually quite Quite an experience to see the materiality of, of, of these books that have been produced during wartime. And especially, I mean, see, having seen some of Bernal's own books in that state. So could you tell us a little bit more about Haldane and his political, well, political peers within the scientific community and how he related to them? Was there something that in some ways set him apart from the others? Because he did take what was in many ways an unanticipated decision in the 50s. So... What did you as a biographer observe about him and this set of characters, including the visiting Russians, right? Like in, in the 30s at the big conference in, at, at Cambridge and uh, of which, which he also attended with Boris Sesson and others. So a little more about that. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's really interesting because you had at this time this entire cohort of scientists, you know, in the, in the UK who were drifting leftwards. And of course, each person may have had different reasons for doing so. And if anybody wants to check this out, there's a brilliant book by Gary Worski, which examines five or six of these leading scientists of the era and examines the reasons that each of them drifted leftwards. Haldane was quite unique because his father, you know, right from the beginning had decided that, look, science should not be done in a lab for the benefit of scientists and publications alone. It should go out into the world. It should lift up the lives of the people who, who need you know, support and progress. And so, you know, Haldane was aware, for example, that his father went into slums in Scotland and tried to measure the air quality and correlate that with lung diseases and other types of illnesses. I mean, this was really the purpose of science for JBS. And he never fit into patrician society in the UK as a result. Mm -hmm. He was badly bullied at, bullied at Eton, never quite got along with anybody, he hated that world for most of his time there, and then went into the trenches where, again, he suddenly found this relatively egalitarian society where it didn't matter if your father had land and estates in Scotland or not. If you were a private and you reported to a colonel, you still sort of, you respected that. And there was a kind of a different hierarchy that didn't really depend upon wealth and class. Mm -hmm. And that sort of encouraged him hugely because he found he enjoyed being with people like that. And then of course, I think there's like a, you know, the young person's inevitable drift leftwards anyway, that I think happens to all of us in our idealistic late teens and 20s. But Haldane got a chance to go to the Soviet Union, and he was highly impressed. This was just before Stalin's big purges began. And so you could actually go around the Soviet Union and kind of be fooled into thinking that everything was rosy. He went and saw these vast you know, palaces converted to scientific institutions and the kind of money that was being poured into scientific programs. 
And if you were a scientist who believed in the value of science, the USSR seemed to offer a model by which you could advance as a country on the back of science. Bernal made this great sort of comparison about the amount of money relative to the budget that was being invested in science in the Soviet Union as compared to the UK. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union at that time was decidedly more invested in science at the time. And so for all of these reasons, he really started to look upon a socialist society and particularly communist Russia or communist USSR as a, a kind of shining model of how science and society ought to interact. And it wasn't until much later, which I guess we will come to, but it wasn't until much later that some kind of disillusionment set in. One last thing, of course, is that if you were a leftist in the 90, late 90, in the early to mid 1930s, you were seen and you believed your side was a bulwark against fascism. You know, so Eric Hobsbawm, for example, the great historian, writes about how at that time it was really sort of, you, you felt a thrill to be a, leading the uh, sort of, the, you were in the vanguard against Mussolini and Franco and the, Nazi, and, and the Nazis in Germany. And I think that also, again, sort of, you know, really lit a fire under him. Mm -hmm. And eventually in the, end, in the early 1940s, he officially joins the Communist Party. But by that time, he's been a fellow traveler for many years. Thinking about the Soviet Union and uh, colleagues of mine have drawn a distinction between political freedom and scientific freedom, right? Like, so if you look at Peter Kapitsa, who was literally kidnapped from Cambridge and taken back to the Soviet Union, had the freedom and the funding to do whatever science he wanted, but of course he was politically not free. I think this delicate balance was something that him and many others tried to, in a sense, compartmentalize and create for themselves this possibility, or I wouldn't say desirability, no, I shouldn't say desirability, but it, it was a... It, it was something which they found themselves always sort of tilting towards wanting and not so much criticizing. And it, it makes me wonder, you know, also what exactly they were thinking, especially when we, when we find out, for example, that Vavilov has died in the Gulag. And here is a scientist whose research itself was resistance, who finds himself on the wrong side. And at that point of time, the political freedom versus scientific freedom argument is very, very delicately held. And of course, it comes to a fore, and, and we'll, we'll come to that. What about his other kinds of friends at this point of time? Because you, are, you, you did mention right at the start that you know, he is, of course, part of a practicing scientific community, but he has other friends, so to speak, that are others who he's interacting with. And here, uh, you know, to, to just, because, you know, he's, he's written poetry, funny ones. He, of course, writes essays tremendously. So what about the larger world of which he's a part? Could you give us a sense of the community that he's, he's uh, you know, hanging out with? He seemed to be quite social, but it was very difficult to pinpoint whether he had any close friends. He was a prickly character. I mean, somebody called him a uh, big porcupine, you know, in a sense, because he had very little patience with idiots. He had slightly bohemian lifestyles to an extent that is still not clear. You know, for example, he married a woman who was already married to somebody else. They had to get divorced. And that almost got him kicked out of Cambridge. His habit of speaking his mind to people alienated, you know, a lot of people who were still quite polite about various aspects of society. For example, while he was going through this big scandal in Cambridge, yeah. where he was seeing this woman who was already married to somebody else and in the process of getting a divorce, he would push his chair back from the Cambridge dining table and say, well, right, I'm off to sleep with my mistress tonight. And then he would go off. And then, you know, this would shock and scandalize everyone. And he, he never held back from any of this stuff. So as far as sort of a group of friends goes, you know, he was close to Aldous Huxley and Julian Huxley yep. because they grew up together in Cambridge. He was close to a few other scientists. Much later, of course, John Maynard Smith, the geneticist, yep. came to him as a student and they remained friends for life. In fact, in the archives, there's a great letter, the very first letter that Smith writes to Haldane, introducing himself, saying, look, I'm an, actually an engineer, but I want to learn genetics. And he addresses Haldane as comrade, comrade Haldane. And that is essentially the, the basis of their very friendship is the Communist Party and socialism. And so he finds some friends that are political friends as well. But you never got the sense that he had a bestie or he had sort of a group of, you know, a core group of people who he, he stayed true to and stayed loyal to throughout his career. That's interesting. Also the life of the mind, so to speak, right? And, and, and who you let in and, who, you know, what do you do with it in the world out there? So here's a man, eccentric by all, well, all stretches of all imagination and very political, political in his science, political in his politics, difficult in his personal life. And we are in the 50s where the first hot war, so to speak, is the Korean War. And Suez comes very close 
on its heels within about three years. It's an interesting period in the Cold War because, of, because of the 40s, late 40s were the congealment of the equation, so to speak, or the, or the camps, so to speak, for the, for, uh, for the Cold War. The 50s become interesting because things start flaring up all over again. And in 56, with the Suez crisis, you have Haldane deciding, okay, I'm done with this and I'm going to India. And of course, he becomes a citizen too at some point. Tell us more about the India in his life prior to 1956, and which brings in another interesting character, but I'll let you talk about him, and his, and his decision. I, I want us to first talk about his decision to move to India and the political context, following which it would be wonderful to also talk about the kind of work he initiated and the kind of work he began, which led to the establishment of more than one laboratory in India. But the decision first. Yeah. Well, I mean, so Haldane had a lot of India in his life even earlier. I mean, he was wounded in World War One and sent to India to recuperate. And he spent almost a year here in various places, including in the north, in the hills in Uttarakhand, what is now Uttarakhand. He was in Pune for a long while, convalescing. And he really came to have very definite views about India at the time. And he enjoyed being here. He read literature from here in translation, including some of the epics, the philosophy, the novels, all of this stuff. He went to the assembly in Delhi and he watched Jinnah speak. Uh, so he was very engaged politically with the Indian freedom struggle as well. And then when he went back to the UK through his years and decades as a scientist, he would follow Gandhi and he would follow Nehru. He admired Nehru greatly. And in the early 1950s, he got the chance to come to India to lecture a little bit, you know, kind of lecture too. And he... Uh, Almost had the chance to meet Nehru then. As it turned out, they couldn't actually meet. But he went back to England and he wrote Nehru a big letter, which is in the archive saying, look, I think your biological education needs this, 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 this. And they corresponded a few times. By that time, Haldane had also sort of burnt some of his bridges in England. Mm. He had fallen out of favor with the Communist Party over there, over a big sort of tussle over ideology in a sense. He had resigned from the party formally. And he was really looking to do something else with his life. The USSR also had been tarnished a little bit in his eyes by then. And he was looking for a new society that he could idealize. And India seemed to be it, a kind of Nehruvian society built on the back of science and rationality. And he loved that. How old was he then? He must have been, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this because when he came to India in 1957, somebody asked him why he was leaving. And among the other reasons he gave, one of the reasons was 60 years in socks is enough. He wanted to live somewhere where he could wear chappals and a dhoti, and that's what he did. But as I said, there's always more than meets the eye. So one of the things that I found out while I was in the archives was that he was in quite a dismal financial state. Mm. You know, he has all the bank slips are actually in his archives now in the National Archives. And if you look through them, you'll see that he's permanently in the red. He is paying alimony for one wife. He is out of his pocket trying to pay for lab facilities in University College London, which had been badly damaged in the bombing in the war. He's trying to pay for salaries for other people who worked for him. Once he bought a set of teaspoons for the common room because he found that the tea, there were no teaspoons in the common room. So he was really spending out of pocket and he realized that he couldn't support himself anymore. And so, you know, this is something that's, that was sort of a revelation to me. I mean, you always think of big, grand reasons for people moving from one place to another when it comes to people like Haldane. But there are also the mundane things that you and I think about, which is, can I afford living here? When he went to ISI in Calcutta, PC Mahalanobis, who headed the institution then, promised him, among other things, to match his British salary, give him a house and a car and a position for his second wife. And all of this, I think, drew him here as well. So it's, it's a conglomeration of reasons. It is telling that he found a way to dress this up politically yeah. and to say, you know, I'm sick of Western society's hypocrisy, you know, the UK's hypocrisy. I'm leaving for India, which I think is, has a brighter political future. And he might have believed that genuinely, but there were also like three or four other reasons propelling him this way. And what were the disappointments after he came here? Oh, I think he was sort of, he, he grew disappointed with the kind of education that people had when they came to him to do their graduate degrees. He found that they weren't able to analyze or to write or to think even. He wrote a great big screed on the state of Indian science, which was published, which still remains extremely relevant today in some parts, deploring all of these habits of the Indian higher education system. He was fed up with bureaucracy and politeness. Yes, of course, everybody deferring to him and kind of kowtowing to him. There's a great letter again in the archives in ISI Calcutta, 
where he's you know, one of his big bureaucratic you know tussles with the institution eventually culminates him in him writing a letter to the director saying look i have these curtains that were made for my apartment and i'm going to burn the curtains on the lawn this kind of drama happens there as well and then finally he goes from calcutta to bhubaneswar where biju patnaik gives him a lab and sets him up and by that time he's kind of old and older and frail and so he sets about building a small cohort of students there but he passes away before anything can really be made of the institution and the lab shuts down soon after so it's difficult to assess his indian sojourn and to wonder whether he was satisfied with it or not but he enjoyed being here he really sort of reveled in the flora and the fauna mm-hmm. and so he reverted to sort of the earliest kinds of biological practice which is not so much you know arithmetic and genetics and so on but just watching and observing the richness of biological life in this country and urging people to you know look around them and taxonomize and to kind of cross breed and cross pollinate and think about genetics in a very fundamental way what's the funniest thing you found out about him in the archive well i mean you know his letters from india are hilarious you know he's forever urging his friends from the uk to come and visit him yes. you know so aldous huxley for example they, they correspond and he says come to calcutta we will kill a fatted goat for you and then he goes on to say i am vegetarian i want you to know he he adopted a completely vegetarian you know, lifestyle over the latter part of his life and you will see photos of him you know cranky and cantankerous looking even while he is at rest you know in a dhoti and a kurta and really kind of you look at that and you you feel quite moved by the strange and amazing journey of this man in his life i think i was quite moved in fact i told a number of people i was quite moved when i came to the end of that life when i wrote that little scene of his death because it's not often that you get to see the entire span of somebody's life from birth to death and so when you are seeing him on his deathbed you are also remembering the little letters he wrote to his grandmother as a 4 year old or a 5 year old talking about the ice cream that he had and you feel you know there's a there's a poignancy over there that was quite uh, quite new to me i hadn't encountered that before. is there any part of him that you identify with often biographers are um if uh, not anything accused of uh, identifying with their subject uh, uh, my wife would say the cantankerousness <laughs> but i would uh, probably say the intellectual sort of just the, the curiosity the breadth of it he was interested in everything yeah. that the best anecdote one of the best anecdotes is how he was sitting in a waiting room in the uk in a station in london somewhere and there were two indians on the next bench arguing about you know how many how many languages india had or something like that and one of them uh, was citing one number and one of them was citing another number this was well before he moved here by the way and at some point he intervened and said no this is the right number and the person who observed this all happen he then that person then went away and looked up the answer and that was the answer i mean you know as a, at least in so far as there was a list yeah. made of this so i mean he just he, he was interested in everything and i love that about him yeah tremendously interesting character and rather tenderly written about by someone i can't recommend the book strongly enough for all of us to go and access thank you for staying on for the full conversation if you like what you heard please share it with family and friends you can also leave us a review on itunes or apple podcasts the crew that makes these podcasts possible are gaurav krishna and ishan gupta on sound supervision and production with support from s sarvanaraj and raghavendra tenkaila artwork and design is by chandni venkataraman of chris cross design studios don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.